name is Zarina Islami, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of English here at Michigan State University. Hi, my name is Amanda. Uh, Amanda's wife. Um, Amanda and I, can everyone hear me? Do I need to use this? Better. Better? better? Okay. Um, I like the wireless effect. Um, Amanda and I want to welcome everyone um, for coming today. This is a very special occasion and a bittersweet one, of course. Um, M.A. Ellis came to the English department in 2002 from the University of Kentucky. I arrived in 2005. With me, as with many other junior faculty arriving after, after him, M.A. was careful to provide politic wisdom on the department and reassuring words of advice about how to balance service, research, teaching, and a private life. However, as I knew him, he contributed endless hours and energy uh, to the department, participating on search committees, recruiting graduate students, uh, minority graduate students, um, and teaching in our London Study Abroad program, to name just a few of the activities to which he devoted himself. He also taught his students to grasp how questions of race impact daily life, forever enriching their worldviews. He and his band, The Pleasures of Exile, whose members um, are here or will be here shortly, um, wrote, played, and recorded rock and roll with a cosmopolitan sensibility. He and his wife Amanda built a beautiful home together with their demanding but always loving dog, Marley. And he worked on this book, which we're celebrating today. The book is a perfect combination of Amy's professional and personal passions. It brilliantly displays crit Amy's critical creativity and his ability to make legible for all of us the creativity of those consigned to the margins of society. Amy passed away from cancer in the summer of 2009. We wish that he could be here to celebrate with us. But we are grateful, we're so grateful, um, for the presence of so many friends, scholars, and uh, students today. We have a wonderful group of distinguished scholars, um, academics in Amy's field, who have also graciously and enthusiastically agreed to come together to talk about the book, If We Must Die. I want to thank each of them for taking the time to come out for this event. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize Mr. Kenneth Ellis, Amy's father, who is here from Old Harbor, Jamaica, for the event. Um, we're so glad that you can be here. Uh, Steve Arch, the chair of the English department, Geneva Smitherman, and Salah Hassan, all involved in the planning of the event. Um, I'd like to thank Brant Peterson on the faculty of the anthropology department, and Jim Porter, a graduate student in history, um, who are great friends of Amy's and co-members of his band, The Pleasures of Exile. I'd like to recognize Fumiko Sakashita, a very valued graduate student of Aime, who is here all the way from Kobe, Japan, to be with us today. Um, and I'd like to thank Lucille Yergolaitis in the English department, Alina Ostapow, and, and Dori uh, Penninen in the, from the Center for Gender, and Emily Nowick at Wayne State University Press for all of their efforts in making today happen. I'd like to take a moment to recognize the people who aren't here today. Um, Mrs. Ms. Ora Ellis, Amy's mother, unfortunately could not come. Dana Nelson and Virginia Bloom, um, former colleagues and friends, also could not make it. We'd like to thank them for all of their support and good wishes. Finally, I'd like to thank the co-sponsors of this event, the Center for Gender and Global Context, Dean Burst and the College of Arts and Letters, the Office for Inclusion and Intercultural Initiatives, and African American and African Studies at MSU, um, along with Wayne State University Press. Hello, I apologize for my voice. Um, I'd just like to say thank you um, all to everyone for being here today. Thank you from the very bottom of my heart. Um, we'd now like to introduce Dean Karen Burst from the College of Arts and Letters, who will say a few words on behalf of the college. Arts and Letters, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our visitors from outside of the university and of course to our uh, members from the university committee for coming, uh, community for coming together today. This is a wonderful idea originating from MA's home department, his colleagues in the English department, to celebrate his life through this public book launch uh, and round table. What a great idea. I also want to commend all of you who participated to do the final edits on his book. I understand this kind of labor of love quite well from personal experience. Um, uh, I, m my doctor father passed away as, um, uh, at a young age as well, and uh, since I was one of the students who was closest to his field, I worked from East Lansing. One of my first jobs in East Lansing was to work on, on finishing his manuscript with a colleague from Ohio State. 
So I understand this, uh, this labor of love. This is very special. It's, uh, of course, uh, bittersweet, that dialogue. And um, I'm sure you all had experiences that, uh, that you will never forget uh, trying to put this uh, book together and finish uh, putting the final touches on it. So I commend you uh, on this. Uh, I'm sure you found the experience moving and uplifting at the same time. So thank you. Celebrating MA's uh, life and legacy through this event and discussing his book will not only be very meaningful for you, his family, friends and colleagues, but for his students uh, who admired him and appreciated his way of being as a teacher. He obviously was inspiring but tough as an educator, challenging his students to care about what he was teaching them, as we can hear in comments and uh, on blogs. Other comments suggest that his teaching went beyond critical intellectual concerns, but that M.A. had touched his student's soul. As you know better than I, these kinds of comments are numerous. Again, um, I'm so pleased that you could make it uh, to, to, to celebrate uh, his life in this way. Um, I think this is a wonderful idea, and uh, I wish you all the best and good, uh, good conversations this afternoon. Thank you so much for inviting me, and um, please. Thank you so much. So I will start um, with a brief introduction to uh, the book and some reflections, and, uh, and then we can go on from there. Um, I consider this, I really wanted to say something because I consider this a continuing conversation with Amy, our colleague and friend, and we would have many, many discussions on these issues of race and others. And second, I'd just like to do a personal reminiscence why being here is sort of, as Zarina said, very bittersweet, that I jokingly always called Amy my native informant, because whenever I was away, I used to phone him, and he would give me detailed descriptions of everything I ever missed in the department of the university. <laughs> so today, I, I've just been kind of reliving a moment that Amy is going to phone me to ask me about today, and say, who came, and what did they say, and what did what is my discuss? And so I'm sort of trying to relive that imaginary, bittersweet moment. And so that was very important to me. The other thing I want to just briefly mention, um, that Amy and I talked together in, in 2007 in the London program, which is a very special experience because he was teaching Afro-Caribbean empire and I was teaching South Asian empire. And we had some wonderful uh, sense of the complex histories of different peoples brought to England by the exigencies of empire, and you know that's what Rashida is working on. Okay, I think now I will just sort of introduce the book and, and give you my sort of sense of it, and for people in the audience who may not have read the book as yet, uh, and I'm not sure everybody would agree with me or even Amy would agree with me, but I think this is my sense of it. In Amy Ellis's book, If We Must Die, we can hear a clear and passionate voice at a much more intense pitch than the, general, than the more gentle voice of the Amy we knew. And it's this intensity of this passion that animates this work of cultural and literary analysis. First, the book asserts that the cultural imaginations of many contemporary US black men have been shaped by a deathly history of racial terror and state violence. Second, this book shows that paradoxically, it's, it is the same history of terror and state violence that has supplied many black male writers, musicians, and filmmakers you can hear my voice, with an unlikely horizon for imagining freedom, a horizon, upon, um, a horizon upon which freedom is charted in relation to overcoming one's fear of death. In different ways, Ellis demonstrates how on the one hand, the narrative of black pathologies is appropriated and dehumanized by a process, although often aestheticized of commodification, <laughs> And on the other hand, he points out that no correlation is generally made between mainstream hedonistic consumerism of these death-inspired products and reproduction of a social system that perpetuates and maintains an underclass. And the aim of this book, as he says, I think very eloquently, and I'm sort of using his words throughout, is to carry on the vital discussion about poor urban black men and the psychic worlds they inhabit, and the death-embracing and death-defying strategies they deploy. As I was reading this book in the past few weeks, a lot of events, local and national, would kind of impinge on my reading about the kind of assault by state and corporate interests um, to, to the black uh, urban underclass that this book refers to. For instance, the Michigan government has cut cash assistance to people, you know, just 
out, you know, cold turkey and they have to be left without any money. It cuts to public transport in a, in a city in Detroit and other places where many people don't own cars. There was a lot of flaunting in the Republican um, you know, the uh, primaries about how many people they put to death in the death row in Texas uh, with a disproportionate number of, you know, uh, minorities. So all those issues really made more and more sense as I was reading Amy's book alongside. And to quote Ome, uh, Amy, he says, he states, um, he states the number of ways in which patriarchal beliefs and sexist ideologies can be understood in the minds of poor black urban men as both self-performing and self-destructive, empowering and nihilistic. And I think the book is really brilliantly framed with a wonderful reading of Richard Wright's Native Son. And you know, all of us, many of us have taught that, but this reading is, I think, really stunning. And once again, he shows in the script how racial mythologies, which had not been commodified for popular consumerism perhaps at the time, but they were nonetheless pervasive in the dominant cultural imaginary. And as Ellis asks, do not Bigger's violent behaviors also constitute the very expression through which he is able to gain consciousness, restore his self-respect, assert his humanity. So we have the same doubleness ambivalence between self-destruction and self-discovery. Can Bigger's behaviors, Ellis asks, somehow reflect both at once? In each of these chapters, Amy Ellis shows similar tensions between the death-defying and death-embracing strategies of poor urban black men in their lives and in the hip-hop, R&B music, music videos, and in some cases in the mainstream call to black men to speak out and on behalf of young black men, which Amy Ellis, drawing from Henry Louis Gates, describes as narrating the Negro. What is remarkable is, I think, it's, it's really very subtle and very nuanced, and it really works through the book, is that both the nationalist bourgeois blacks and the death-defying embracing artists seem to draw from the same script of black urban uh, male pathologies and all the stereotypes, and yet they deploy them for different ends. And I think what's stunning about this book is that it doesn't make anyone comfortable. It's a very discomforting book. And I think that he holds every party accountable. And, and behind very kind of nuanced readings and, and stories, I think there's a clear kind of moral compass that sort of holds the, holds the narrative st steady uh, in the face of these representational conundrums. For instance, he faults the Moynihan r report, which diverted responsibility away from the federal government and put it on the black family. And yet he critiques Elridge Cleaver for his notions of male supremacy and homophobia, even while endorsing the value of Cleaver's political critique. And I'm sure that everybody will speak on in detail. I just want to talk on one chapter, which I thought was really compelling. In a really powerful chapter on the hip-hop soul artist Michael D'Angelo Archer, Ellis interrogates, interrogates the deployments of violence and objectification, both by the media critics and producers of his music video of his Grammy-winning single, Untitled. Viewing this video in terms of gender performativity among black men, Ellis provides a detailed description of the ways in which this performance evokes erotic performance and violent laboring of black male sexuality. He links this in very stunning ways to a deathly call emanating from the ghosts of Marvin Gaye and Prince, among others. So uh, Amy Alex asks, quote, what would it mean to read the D'Angelo signature love songs, both in terms of a racialized history of patriarchal violence, and also find in these same erotically and emotionally evocative songs some insurgent possibilities, unquote. Again, you know, sort of looking for a different script. But then in a twist, Amy Ellis recounts how some ma media critics view this music video with its representations of the black male body in relationship to, for instance, Maplethorpe's when loan photography of black men. In this process, I think Amy very, very astutely observes, D'Angelo's body and music video are in inadvertently rendered at once fixed in time and stripped from the deeply rooted matter of history. To complicate the picture of D'Angelo, Amy Ellis also reads his soulful and erotically charged performance in relation to the tradition, as I mentioned before, violence directed against and internalized by the famous Marvin Gaye. And in fact, an interesting account shows that D'Angelo projected Gaye's fraught relationship with his father, who fatally shot him, to his own fear of dying at the hands of his own father, who was a Pentecostal preacher. And Ellis casts a sharp eye at this violence directed within the community, linking it to that coming beyond. And I'll quote, to be sure for many black men, the unforgotten legacies of white supremacist violence, 
to the 20th century produced a profound masculine anxiety concerning the proper assertion of patriarchal authority in black families and communities. Thus, finally, to sum up, M.A. Ellis warns repeatedly against the self-objectifications and outside objectifications that may glorify performative erotic violence on and by black men in ways that occlude the social conditions and history that produced it. Histories of mental illness, poverty, unemployment, uh, imprisonment, social isolation, war, uh, and so forth. And finally, he evokes the ghosts and he says, he says, here resides the ghosts of Richard Wright's Bigger Thomas, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, Chester Himes' Bob Jones, the real life stories of US black male musicians, Charlie Parker, Jimi Hendrix, Marvin Gaye, to name a few, who died tragically in a mysterious haze of delirium, points, uh, po uh, points to insidious history of violence directed and internalized against black men. And the last line of the book is, this indicates a longing relationship with death that is still yet to be unraveled. So, but I finally believe that um, this book opens the way to consider life in a different way. And I think, you know, people may disagree. I think it's very life affirming. It's like he's, he's calling all of us in that old 60s line to stand up and be counted for a world in which every life counts. And to end that, I just want to read a short poem which is called On Living, uh, which is by Nazim Hikmet, who was a Turkish a revolutionary poet who was in prison for like 19 years. And all the time he was in prison, he wrote these very, very revolutionary life-affirming poems. And I'll just read it and I, we will end on that. And I think this poem to me represents both Amy's life and his book. It's called On Living by Nazim Hikmet. Living is no laughing matter. You must live with great seriousness, like a squirrel, for example. I mean without looking for something beyond and above living. I mean living must be your whole life. Living is no laughing matter. You must take it seriously, so much so and to such a degree that, for example, your hands tied behind your back and your back to the wall. I mean, you must take it seriously that even at 70, for example, you plant olive trees and not for your children either. Because although you fear death, you don't believe it. Because living, I mean, weighs heavier. Let us say we are at the front for something worth fighting for, say. There in the first offensive on that very day, we might fall on our face dead. We'll know this with a curious anger, but we'll still worry ourselves to death about the outcome of the war, which could last for years. Let's say we are seriously ill, need surgery, which is to say we might not get up from the white table, even though it's impossible not to feel sad about going a little too soon. We'll still laugh at the jokes being told. We will look out of the window to see if it is raining, or still wait anxiously for the latest newscast. I mean, however and wherever we are, we must hold a star among the stars and one of the smallest, a gilded moat on a blue velvet. I mean, this our great earth will grow cold one day, not like a block of ice, but like an empty walnut, it will roll along in pitch black space. You must grieve for this right now. You have to feel this sorrow now. For the world must be loved this much if you're going to say I lived. We must live as if we will never die.